Welcome back to another episode of the Daily Flip Podcast. I'm your host, Alex, and today we're going to be flipping through some stories that have to pertain to our future. We have three different topics from three, three different areas. We have one talking about AI, one talking about space exploration and understanding the universe we live in, and then another talking about the banking system and its future. These are all future topics, and I didn't give an episode number because I'm preparing. I'm going to have a crazy few weeks, and I want to have a few stored-up videos, and we're not going to talk about current politics. We're going to talk about looking towards the future and maybe inspiring a few different people, or maybe just giving you some more information on topics that you think are enjoyable and fun. So we'll still end with our daily delight. Don't get me wrong, because we want you to leave here feeling positive and happy. But that's enough ranting for me. Let's jump in to our daily debate. So when you look towards the future, when you look at where humanity is going, what is your favorite prediction that you've heard from some of your friends, maybe your crazy uncle, maybe from a different scientist about where we're going or what some of the greatest inventions will be? One of my favorite ones is personally that we'll be colonized on Mars by 2030. Oh, wait, nope, that one was made by Elon Musk, and it doesn't look like what that one's happening. But it's an interesting concept, and maybe you have some crazy ones of your own. If you do, throw them down in the comment section. I'd love to hear what y'all have to say. So let's jump to our first article. This one's coming from Vox. Scared tech workers are scrambling to reinvent themselves as AI experts. So obviously we know that AI has come out. We've had this new renaissance, this new wave of AI technology and interest in AI products, not just on the in the community, because that's been being pushed for a little bit of time now, especially with algorithms and the amount of data that can be collected from different AI programs. We've seen the industry focus in on this for a long time. And you've probably seen a lot of comments that are on the information pages of different products saying, oh, we use AI or we use this algorithm. It was kind of becoming a buzzword and people thought, ooh, bleeding edge. But now we're actually starting to see these large scale developments with the large language models and we can understand truly how powerful AI is without it being in the background and doing things that are unobservable to us. Now we can see it, we can touch it, we can implement it, we can use it ourselves. So that shift in the market or the shift within these companies eventually made it to the market. And now we're starting to hear the rumblings again of, oh, AI is going to come for all the jobs. And if there's one place that's true uh, out of everything else, it is the tech industry. Because AI itself can write code, meaning that it could, in theory, debug itself. So what? Debuggers don't have to necessarily be as prominent or the really unskilled debuggers, those first few interns that are brought in from large colleges, they could be laid off or you wouldn't have to hire them in the first place. And then also, as it moves forward and if it's able to code, then it could even create more complex AI systems, meaning some AI engineers may not be needed or in general, maybe if it's not for AI stuff, just certain coding engineers won't be needed. So let's jump to a quote from what they have here, and we can start to discuss how some of these workers, some of these tech industry folks, are shifting in order to keep up with this new trend. Quote, while tech workers are dealing with pay stagnation, layoffs, and generally less demand for their skill than they've enjoyed for the past decade, the artificial intelligence specialist has become the new it girl in Silicon Valley. All of the products that that we're working on that we're seeing today are shifting towards an AI-powered type of operation, said Zach Brown, founder of the AI startup Nonprofit HQ. This is a rough time to be a regular software engineer. When Brown was looking for jobs last year, he hadn't updated his resume to focus on all the work he had done with AI in his previous roles. Previously, the 28-year-old had been used at companies tripping over themselves to talk to an experienced software engineer, but all of a sudden he wasn't seeing the same interest, end quote. So there's actually two aspects of this here. There's one that people moving forward want a person who is very well acquainted with AI. So 
new companies who are just starting up or even old ones that don't have AI software in place or don't have experience using AI in their own material. They're looking for experts in this field so they can say, hey, we want to be able to take advantage of any of the new AI information, any of the new practices that are going on in the market because we see this as advantageous. So these workers are going, okay, well, hey, I, I haven't actually put my AI work on my resume because, you know, I've been at a solid job for two or three years. I don't necessarily need to. My engineering skill alone should speak for itself. And of course, AI is involved in that, but maybe I can elaborate on that. But now people are starting to realize if you don't have AI right there out front, then you're going to get passed over when people are, are looking for you. So that's aspect number one. And then aspect number two is that artificial intelligence is the new it girl of Silicon Valley. So you're going to see over time that when these people shift to AI, AI is going to start becoming more advanced. And then when AI becomes more advanced, it will slowly displace some of the lower level tech workers and just software engineers who are doing their job normally in Silicon Valley. So no longer will you need a person who's spent 20 hours working on a brand new project, or maybe I should be more clear here, maybe you don't need that one person who's worked 50 hours a week for two years, really has a deep understanding of the systems at play here. No, you could feed all that information, all the raw data into an AI, and it could do most of the work of a team of engineers, and then you just have one or two people spot check it and go through and make sure that all the code that's coming out is correct. So we're seeing a huge shift, and obviously people people know this. And I've talked a little bit about the, what the implications of this would be, but I think it's really interesting to look at how it is affecting the industry that is most in contact is probably the best way to put it. The industry that works with AI already. The industry that is also most vulnerable to AI considering most of what they do is write a basically write a script and solve problems. And if you can have a system with a large raw amount of data that just needs to know how to write that script and able to analyze a million different problems from the raw data that it has that are similar, then that's a very vulnerable industry just like any writers would be in the Hollywood arena or any screenwriters for some of these Netflix shows you may have seen the strike that went on a few weeks ago. So this is a very vulnerable industry. So what's actually happening right now? Well, quote, big tech companies are scouting AI talent from universities, even while we're sending offers to non-AI talent, says Zaire Musa, co-founder of Levels.FYI, which also helps candidates negotiate offers. These, those companies are also trying their best to hold on to talent they have, offering key AI engineers multi-million dollar retention bonuses, lest they have a more exciting opportunity at another firm, especially smaller ones where the work might be more interesting and for potential growth, both financial and technically, are higher. Quote, it's kind of a bonanza, Musa said. We're seeing people go from everywhere to everywhere. End quote. So, it's really, really crazy right now. You're seeing a lot of companies pour lots of resources into making sure that they have the best AI talent out there. And it really speaks to the fact that if you're going forward and you haven't at least acquainted yourself or used any of these AI systems at all, you probably should. You should go about finding the best way to prompt them. See what you can play with. See different ways that you can ask questions. See what kind of information you can get out of it. Uh, there's one thing that's really, really stupid that I do, but it's interesting just to see how ChatGPT does it. So I, whenever I want to make a decision about, oh, do I want this extra blah or that extra blah, and I'm having an indecisive moment, and I'm just like, you know what, I want to export this decision, I'm just trying to be a little bit goofy, not be too serious, I ask ChatGPT, flip a coin 1,000 times, label heads as blank, tails as blank, and output the results. Whenever you do this, it'll probably give you 15 different answers over the 15 different times that you ask it. Sometimes it'll output them one by one. Sometimes it'll just output the final results. Sometimes it'll try to give you a graph and plot it. And I think it's really interesting just to experiment and see what's going on with this technology. And the reason I think it's important that you do it 
is because, as you can see here, there is a shift in at least having some understanding of how these AI systems work. Even if it is just a fad, you can at least go in and use your knowledge when asking or trying to get employed at a different company. Say that you've used it in this way. And then also, if you're the one to bring that technology, or at least the mass use of that technology in an efficient way at your company, imagine what it will do. It will give you a little bit of promotion. It will give you a little bit of credit with the uh, founders or the bosses that you have. And then you can even put it on your resume, brought AI integration, blah, 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 on your resume for the next job that you apply to if you successfully brought in AI and found a use for it. So this is a burgeoning market, and we're seeing the shift, and we're seeing it especially in the industry that is closest to it, and it will be a barometer and a thermometer for what's going on in the rest of the market. And I think that you should take it seriously, and you should go forward. If you're a 40-year-old male who's listening to this right now, or a 35-year-old female, or an 18-year-old, all of you, thank you for joining me. Just start using AI. That's the only thing I have to say about this one. But it is, it is nice to see that people are willing to pivot and shift very quickly, and that is the beauty of our free market system. There's a new opportunity. There's a new way to gain the edge. Or, I mean, let's be clear, maybe it's not just because it's a new way to gain the edge and people are running for it. It's more now out of obligation because they're behind the curve. But that's the beauty of our competitive forces in this world and especially in this country that we live in. If there's something that's going to aid companies and they want to see it, then people are going to respond and they're going to shift towards it. So don't be on the back end of that curve too much. You don't have to go crazy. You don't have to turn all your workflows into AI. You don't have to export all your opinion making to AI. But you can at least become familiar with the systems because it's going to be a useful tool and probably one we're not going to see shed or taken away for quite some time until we have another renaissance of AI or a different technology. All right, so we got through the AI topic. Now, I said that we would talk about space and banking, and I kind of want to leave the space one towards the end because that's a really positive one, and the AI one was semi-positive as well. This one is not necessarily so positive, so I want to sandwich it in the middle between two positive things so we can kind of hide the fact that it is a little bit negative. And this little negative tidbit comes from the Washington Free Beacon, Bank of Un-America banking giant accused of going full woke by consumer group. So yes, this may sound like some of the previous things I've done where I have an article about a very specific issue, but it's more that this article provides a interesting view of the future or gives a glimpse of what could happen when different banking corporations or just different systems within the American world or the United States specifically decide that they are going to pursue certain policies and they're going to punish their customers who do not follow those same policies. Quote, a national ad campaign targeting Bank of America over its politicization business policies says the bank has gone full woke, pointing out the bank's race-based home financing and decision to cut off loans to gun manufacturers and fossil fuel industries. And why this is a problem is not because, oh, They've gone woke. Let's be clear. That is an issue to some people, and it can be an issue moving forward. But that is not exactly why. I don't care what the policy prescriptions or the policy ideas that Bank of America has are. What is interesting is that they are limiting the amount of funding or the amount of loans that they're going to give to certain companies based on their policies, or they're going to prefer a certain segment of the population over another when giving loans based on that person's race, gender, identity, minority status, whatever it may be. And this is the problem with woke politics, but I would even say the bifurcation of business in that if you force businesses to take a side moving forward into our new age economy, then you are telling them, okay, you have your values. Now, I want you to enforce those values because they align with mine. I want you to enforce those values on other people. This is extremely, extremely dangerous. This is probably almost as bad as restricting free speech because it is or could be a means of restricting free speech, but it could go even further. Imagine that you want to protest at the March for Life 
Or let's say you want to protest at a pro-abortion rally, whatever it may be. And the company that you bank with says, no, 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 we're not actually going to agree with your policies. We don't think that you should be able to do X, Y, or Z. So therefore, we're going to restrict the purchases of signs. We're going to restrict the purchases of pro-life or pro-abortion material online. If you are buying this material, you can't do it with your Bank of America card or your Chase card or your Goldman Sachs card. Imagine that is the case moving forward. Then that is directly affecting your ability to go out and give this information to other people, to read up on books that may be about certain topics. And it is well within a business's right to say, hey, we don't want to support some of these different policies. For the most part, if it's a private company, I don't think it should be involved in the business of what people can and can't do. But in theory, they could do it alone. But that only reason that they actually do it and that they're pushed to do it is two, twofold. One, they have activists on the board who truly pr want to pursue these different topics. And then also... The second one is public pressure from the outside. And with these activist groups oh, on one side or the other, left or right, pushing companies to conform to their value systems, you're going to get companies becoming very heavy-handed in the way that they approach this. And this is extremely, extremely dangerous, especially when we're talking about banking. If you remember the trucker convoy that went through Canada and how a lot of the Canadian banks were forced to cut off the amount of money that could go to some of their customers who are part of the convoy or how you had GoFundMe or I can't remember the other one and I feel bad, but GoFundMe was restricting the amount of funds that were coming in from the United States trying to support these truckers who were just trying to express themselves and they were trying to, at the end of the day, push back a government that was restricting their freedoms. So this is extremely, extremely scary, scary stuff. Because you've also seen the possibility of the United States government implementing a centralized digital currency. And imagine what Bank of America can do with you just having their card and saying, oh, no, we won't allow you to buy anything with our card at a firearm store. Imagine what happens when the U.S. government has your account and they're looking at it and saying, oh, wow, he's spending a lot of extra money on donuts this week. Well, you know, we have a nationalized, if we were to have a nationalized healthcare system, or even not that, if the people at the top were just really health conscious and they were to say, well, we actually want our population to be less obese, so we're going to say, you know what, Billy Bob Joe, or even a certain region of the country that may be overweight, we're going to restrict your amount of McDonald's visits to two times. Or what would actually be more implementable is saying, you only have a budget of $20 this week going to McDonald's. Imagine what can happen with that. Not just saying, oh no, you can't use your resources at this place because we don't support it in the case like in the case of Bank of America, but saying, no, no, you have a you're allowed to go somewhere, but you have a limited budget. Imagine that. You can completely control the fabric of society through banking itself. And that's why these movements are extremely scary. And that's why when Bank of America doesn't get any pushback, or at least as much pushback as it should, people should be out outside their office buildings protesting. There should be absolute outrage about this. Because when there's not pushback, when there's not protest, when people aren't obviously out there saying, no, this is wrong, the government could also get the wrong impression when they implement a centralized digital currency that, oh, oh there would be a little bit of outrage, but you know people will get over it. No, we will not get over the fact that you will directly control what we can and cannot buy and tell us where and when we can and cannot buy it. This is why I said this article is going to be negative because it, it really speaks to the authoritarian controlling master aspect of the human side of the existence that we all share, which is if you give people an overwhelming amount of control, then they're going to probably do things that are not in your individualistic interest. And I'm not saying that it is always and always should be your individual interest over the societies or the collectives, but you should have the choice to be selfish. You should have the ability to be selfish and if you choose to not 
help the society, then don't be mad when the society doesn't come and help you. But when it is mandated that you focus on the society and the collective ahead of yourself, that's where I have an issue with it. And it's extremely, extremely sad when you see these companies not getting the resistance that they definitely should. And there's one other aspect to it. So there's one other policy that they implemented on Bank of America did on their way to controlling what their customers can actually purchase. And I think it's an interesting one and it's a hotly debated topic, but I'll read the quote here. Quote, Bank of America announced last year that it would work towards net zero greenhouse gas emissions by pressuring borrowers in the auto manufacturing and energy and power generation industries to reduce their emissions or lose out on loans. The bank said in 2018 that it would stop doing business with gun makers, manufacturers, certain firearms such as AR-15s, end quote. So the firearms we've already discussed a little bit. When it comes to the energy producers or the car manufacturers, you are directly inhibiting innovation in those industries by saying, no, we will not give you loans. We're not going to give you a $200 million loan so you can find a way to make your practices more green or to find a new way to use the fuel that we already have. Maybe they're trying to recycle different fuels. Maybe they're saying, oh, well, you know, we do want to work towards lower emissions, so we're going to use this loan to do that, and maybe Bank of America will let it through. But imagine what happens if you just have a cap saying, oh, no, if you're a company that has this certain level of emissions, we're not going to loan you money. Then how could they ever lower their emissions unless they're using their own internal revenue, which means that they have to divert that revenue from reinvesting into their infrastructure and keeping the pipelines going and keeping all the different people that they have employed. And then usually these companies will go to a outside bank to fund an R&D project. So if that R&D project doesn't work out, then the bank can just seize the assets from that R&D project rather than the rest of the assets under management in the company. Imagine what happens then. You're going to stifle innovation, and this is not okay. How can you move forward? How can you get better if you don't have the means to do so? And when you are being judged by your previous actions and being prevented from giving the means to do so to change them going forward. I know it's a little bit of a simplistic view, but it can be expounded upon further, and it is a little frustrating in my opinion. But you know what? We're not going to harp on the negative for too long. I just wanted to point it out. Be very cautious moving forward. And if you have the time, the energy, the will, fight back against it. Because just because this is negative doesn't mean there's not hope. If there's enough pushback, enough resistance, if there's enough control in the market by the people who do not like these policies, these companies will abandon it. Because remember, what their job is at the end of the day is to make money. And if they feel like they can't make money and these policies are not going to do that for them, then boom, they will most likely stop. Not 100%, but most likely. All right, let's jump to our next article that comes from, I believe it's science. Let me double check this here. Yes, it comes from New Scientist, stunning JSWT or James, I believe James Spider Web Telescope or James Space Webb Telescope. I'm sorry if I can't remember what the exact abbreviation stands for. But the Webb Telescope, they have new images of Saturn that really show off the rings here. And if you're able to go to the link in the description and find the articles today, I would suggest looking at this one first because the images alone are absolutely brilliant. And I think this is the beauty of the space, the telescope, the James Webb telescope that is out there taking deeper, more contrasted or different spectra images from across the universe because it provides a new light through which we can see the rest of the universe. It exposes different phenomenon that we haven't been able to see before. You know, the normal speech that you get from scientists. But why this is so important Remember what happens when you have the idea of something planted in the mind of a child. Not saying it in a negative way, 
But think about it when you have a whole generation of children who see the space landing, who see what America can do, what we're capable of. It really compelled a lot of people to go be aero engineers, which eventually got funneled once the space program was slowed down a little bit, got funneled into private industry or maybe certain segments of NASA who are deploying satellites that we now use in our military operations for GPS locating, for the internet, so on and so forth. So you had one moment or two moments that led to an entire generation, for the most part, going out and being focused towards the stars and space and understanding it and the innovations that came out of that. And this is another opportunity when we look at these stunning images, the first ones that they ever sent back from alternate uh, or providing a different view of our Milky Way galaxy or of this one showing a different side or a different light of Saturn that we don't normally see. It provides children who are growing up nowadays the opportunity to be amazed again in an age where social media is dominant and a whole bunch of things are all over the internet the kids nowadays have so many different data points coming into them at one time or another they don't necessarily get surprised or awestruck as much anymore because oh yeah no no Oh, Dad, yeah, that looks cool. Thanks. That looks really cool. I'm, I'm impressed you did that. I saw someone on TikTok do that two years ago in India or someone in Malaysia. So we've lost a sense of awe to some degree because we're overexposed to a whole bunch of different data. But now we're getting images that we've never seen before coming out of space. And we're able to say, oh, my Lord, this is unique stuff. It's going to stoke a curiosity in children again. And as we become a multi-planetary species, I'm not saying it's happening within this century, but it will 100% happen. Not only because people want to explore, they want to understand other worlds, but also I think it's pretty obvious that people overall are greedy. Not everybody is, but I would say it's underlying human nature to want more. And once we strip this planet, we'll go to a different planet or simply because we want to understand more about our universe and other planets will go to other planets, or if it's simply because Jeff Bezos is going to want more dollars pumped into his stock and he's going to want to control the astro mining industry, we will start exploring these outer regions one way or another. So these images are really thought-provoking and provide a certain level of curiosity to young individuals who will be a part of that future movement. And I think that's absolutely beautiful. So I'll explain why the image looks like it does, and then we'll move on to our daily delight. Quote, Saturn has been captured by the James Webb Space Telescope. Well, okay, yeah, so it's James Webb Space Telescope, but, ah, uh, okay, so they put it backwards in the title. They put JSWT. That's why I was getting confused. Wow, I'm really daft. I should have been able to figure that out. I'm stupid. So Saturn has captured was captured by the James Webb Space Telescope as a ghostly sphere with rings shining brighter than ever before. Three of its moons, Dione, Tethys, and Euclides, are also visible. Quote, it's not famili a familiar view of Saturn by any stretch of the imagination, says Lee Fletcher at the University of Lancaster, UK. Quote, in the atmosphere, you don't see the stripes that are so characteristic of Saturn at deeper levels. And that's because the, this particular wavelength that was chosen is a wavelength where the methane gas in Saturn's atmosphere absorbs almost all the sunlight that's falling upon it. So it looks really dark. So, and the thing is, because it looks so dark, the, the rings, they just pop. They look so vibrant. And let's be clear, it's not just because there's a contrast between them and the planet. It's also probably because of the wavelength they're using and the different chemical makeup of the rings. But it's so brilliant. It really does look like a halo just sitting on top of Saturn. And I think it's beautiful. And maybe it's because I think it's beautiful that I'm a little bit biased saying that it's going to inspire the whole next generation of explorers. But I think there's something here that when people look at it, they'll be awestruck, especially when you have a certain conception of what Saturn looks like. And you see this, it's, it's, going to be, it's going to be beautiful stuff. And I hope a lot of beautiful, kind, loving people who want humanity to thrive see this and they take on aerospace engineering or just space engineering in general. There may be whole new fields that I don't understand. 
uh, general aerospace dy dynamics. Who knows? There could be whole new fields coming up here in the future. But that's the beautiful thing about fo uh, the future focus. We just want to point out things that are going to lead us in different directions and analyze them a little bit. So with all the future focus stuff out of the way, let's go to our normal daily delight. I know I hit you with some positive, negative, and then positive, but we're going to end you with one big positive. This one comes from Newsweek. Watch Husky's adorable reaction to favorite human coming home. I cried. An adorable Husky reaction to her favorite human returning home is a delight on the internet. Rescue dog Stella Four is so happy when her mom comes home that she wiggles her bum, throws her paws in the air, and bounces up and down upon arrival. It really does look like it's your friend when you come in from going out for maybe a few hours and they've you know been they've been partying a little bit and they're like hey johnny and you know you could probably picture what i'm saying here where they throw their hands up in the sky that's what the still photos really do look like of this dog quote she is typically e very excited when i come home stella's owner kristen told newsweek i'm her favorite human just don't let her dad know end quote and trust me you know Kirsten, kristen we don't get too many crazy views on this one you know, people, we don't need to get too many crazy views. The people that want to learn stuff come here. But, you know, we're not going to spread the rumor to your your dad or her dad, to be honest. It's okay. We got you. We'll keep it secret. Nobody, nobody tweet at anybody. Nobody say anything. But if you do want to find this cute photo or video or any of the other articles that I mentioned today, especially if you want to see those Saturn photos, there will be a link below that like and subscribe button to all the articles. Also down there, you can find the link to the podcast on Spotify, Pocket Cast, Google Podcasts, Podvine, as well as the Twitter handle at your daily flip. And though I don't necessarily know when this podcast is going out, because like I said, I'm kind of banking them for the future because things are getting a little bit crazy. I should still be putting out Twitter tirades every Tuesday and Thursday. And you can go over there. Not scripted content. Don't have quotes and all this. Just kind of off the top rant about what's going on or even past topics and just kind of more free flowing. And it's Twitter exclusive. So it's a little bit shorter, maybe like 10 minutes. With all that said, there's only one more thing to say. Stay safe. Don't die.